the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Hello, I'm Christine Morgan, and I'm so glad that you tuned in to this premiere episode featuring me and all my thoughts about the newest star series, Becoming Elizabeth. So if you're like me, you watched right away, and now you are just looking for people to talk with about the episode. So a huge thank you to Rebecca Larson and Tudor's Dynasty for letting me do this chat. Um, If you're a little more chill than me, then you're still waiting for the reviews to come in before you decide to commit to a whole new show. And uh, you know what? More power to you. Everyone is welcome here. Just be aware that there will be spoilers in this and all future episodes. But also, it's history, and you already listened to Tudor's Dynasty podcast, so you shouldn't be too shocked, unless this thing just goes off the rails. Anything is possible, I guess. Uh, I, so I usually host the podcast A Brief History for Tudor's Dynasty, and just so you know, these weekly recaps and fact checks and general sessions about Becoming Elizabeth are going to briefly replace that series. But our regular programming will return uh, just a little later. So, you guys, let's get into it. So, I've been reading your tweets and all of your comments in the different Tudor Facebook groups for a few days now. And I'm going to be really honest. I feel like a super creepy fly on the wall but it has been so much fun to see all your different like ideas and where you think they're going to take the story and things you liked and things you're already a little nervous about. Um, so for future episodes, um, find me on Twitter, tag me, let's chat. Uh, or maybe I'll make a big tweet where everyone can put their thoughts in a thread. So keep an eye out because I want to include your opinions in these recap shows. That's kind of what makes this the conversation. So find me and follow me and we'll chat in real time. And maybe your tweet will end up on this podcast. I really don't know why they're letting me do this. Okay, so to begin, one comment that I saw pretty prominently on premiere day was that people who were not familiar with this new cast of characters had to kind of process and figure out who everyone was as the episode went on. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. For a lot of us, we kind of began our love of Tudor and royal court entertainment shows with Showtime's The Tudors, which I think came out in something like 2007 somewhere around there. Uh, And since then, Stars has been doing these royal series, but obviously they are predating the Tudors with the Plantagenet stories and then only include the very early years of um, Henry VIII's reign. So you are missing characters because there's a lot of history that happens between like the marriage of Henry and Catherine of Aragon and um, his death. So you're going to meet new like courtiers, um, new people on the Privy Chamber, new people in the Privy Council. Uh, so there's two, right? So the Privy Chamber is in charge of the king's body, and the Privy Council is basically in charge of the king's laws. So we already see starting off uh, some Privy Council scenes. And I think, generally speaking, Those can be hard to follow if you don't know who's at the table. So uh, we'll break it down just a little bit today. Um, What I really do love uh, about jumping right into action, which this series did, it starts like on a high, is that my brain is then working in overtime to kind of figure out who is who. But I do understand uh, some of you don't like that, and that's okay. Uh, I think that we're going to see really interesting writing in this series. And I know you're already like tuning out. You're like, oh my goodness, if we're going to talk about dialogue, I don't want to be here. But you guys, (laughs) it's like the most important piece. (laughs) 
<laughs> and it is, it's really good in this series. I've been so impressed. Um, so with the exception of like a couple of timeline hiccups, um, you know, a couple of creative choices, the story really does move and it moves pretty seamlessly. I think that because we spend so much time talking about Henry VIII and his wives and all the factions at his court, it really overshadows what Edward VI inherited. So I'm assuming also that this series will give us a sneak peek into Mary Tudor or Mary I's court. And that will be fun too. I don't know if we've had like a really good series about Mary and definitely not about Edward. So this is like new entertainment territory for all of us. Okay, so the show opens and we realize King Henry VIII is dead. And this sets us up to start on January 28th, 1547. The king died. He was 55. Um, That doesn't sound very old to us now, but I mean, that was quite a few years Uh, to have aged at this period in time. Uh, Anyway, he's 55, and he's famously very physically ill and probably mentally ill as well. And he leaves three children, all of whom have different mothers. And this fact is really Henry VIII's legacy because he's got all the wives, and then ultimately there's this vacuum of power that he leaves for his children to fill or to fight over depending on who you are asking. So the showrunner, uh, which is a fancy word for saying the writer of the show, is Anya Reese, and she tweeted out some Easter eggs that Tudor history fans could find, um, including this quick shot at the start of the dogs looking up the water and whatever else is coming out of the king's casket. Really gross, but yes, actually... There are sources that say this happened. So it's a really nice glimpse. Um, But also, some of you were really, really funny saying um, that you didn't realize the body was Henry VIII because it was too skinny. And can I just say, nothing gets past you guys. And that's why I love you. We're all in this together. So... Now we get our very first look at Edward Seymour, and he is um, the Duke of Somerset. So if you hear people in the show referring to Somerset, they're talking about Edward Seymour, uh, which can be confusing too. I don't think we've had a Somerset yet in these series. Um, So anyway, he opens up this box And he pulls out what we later find out is the king's last will and testament. And then he's immediately on the move to tell the royal children the news. And I think, I think realistically what happened was he locked away the will. He was actually trying to protect it. Um, But there's a lot of drama over who even wrote the will. It's very highly contested. Uh, People are saying that it was sort of rewritten in the last month of Henry's life and that the whole purpose of it was to kind of shuffle the Privy Council um, and obviously stack it with Protestant reformers and remove some Catholics, and there was like a whole big thing there. So we don't know really what the deal is with Henry's will. But in the show, Somerset has it, Um, and he's like immediately off. And I can just promise you he like didn't, put it in his jacket and ride off because that would have been wild. Uh, But, you know, we're here for the drama. So he uh, passes his buddy, John Dudley, uh, a name some of you will recognize, and then they go off and find the children. And what I think I really, really loved about the sequence of scenes where all the children get woken up in the middle of the night, you know, they're ushered into common areas They don't have any idea what the emergency is. And there really is such good acting here. You know, Mary's asking, what do you mean to do to us? Elizabeth is looking at her half-sister. She's terrified and she's like, is this it? So we actually get 
so much context around the fear that these children lived in with warring factions and religious zealots and people who wanted different children on the throne. And um, we get this really nice moment where they're all together and they're all terrified. So it gives us this reality of insecurity and mortality being part of their everyday lives. Um, You know, it's not so great to be a prince or a princess. So, I mean, honestly, it was two lines and it gave us so much. I think I love this show. I think I do. Okay, so this is where we get introduced also to Elizabeth's lady-in-waiting, Cat Ashley, and remember that name because Cat Ashley will be very important in the long term. No spoilers, but you probably already know. So there are some existing sources about Cat Ashley, but I want to see where the show goes. We got to see what kind of character they develop her into. They have a lot of space to work with uh, with Cat Ashley. And then Edward, as we progress, is told he's the new king of England by his uncle, Somerset. And so Somerset, a.k.a. Edward Seymour, is his mother's brother. So And so is Thomas, who we'll meet later. And he's going to be Catherine Parr's love interest. Now, for historical accuracy, there is something that Stars does fairly consistently, which is they cast actors who are just a little bit older than their characters. And hear me out, I actually really like this. So much of these series go into really tough power dynamics, sexual dynamics, abuse, harassment, you know, and honestly... I think that would be really hard to watch. I mean, we can say, oh, the accuracy, the accuracy all day. But I mean, do we really want to watch a bunch of nine-year-olds getting abused? I don't think we do. So um, yeah, it's a no for me. Okay, so the King Edward would have been nine when he became king. But in this series, the actor Oliver Zetterstrom is 15 or 16. And I like this choice because he's giving us some range as well. And he's playing the fear and the grief really beautifully. Um, He's got really great subtle looks that he gives and they can change from moment to moment. And I just think, my goodness, this poor child, his mind is just racing. And then later, obviously, we see that he has some outbursts and a demand for respect as a king. So the range here is such a good choice by the series uh, showrunner. And um, we're getting glimpses even of Henry VIII's legacy, for better or worse, as it manifests now in the form of his son. Really beautiful. So without giving a play-by-play, we get some early character choices uh, with creativity to Edward Seymour Somerset. Um, He's coming off as a jerk, makes him very unlikable, perfectly sets us up um, to like Thomas Seymour. I think that we're supposed to in this uh, particular series, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, So far, though, Edward lacks a lot of empathy. He talks about wanting to be on a battlefield. He's got some power struggle issues with his brother Thomas, and we'll get into that later. I'm sure we'll have more time to talk about that. So it's sort of a pretty heavy front-loaded start to this series. And obviously, we get really nice moments where Elizabeth and Kat are talking about grieving for the king. And then Kat says something like, oh, yes, the the queen will also be grieving or she will be grieving. And then it cuts straight to Catherine and Thomas, like in bed, getting it on, which I think was really comedic. I know some, again, this is another thing. People have a lot of thoughts about this. I've seen all the comments. I've seen all the perspectives. But here's mine. I mean, it's just pure comedy. It was so well done. We had all this really heavy, sad, front-loaded scene, and then it cuts to this sort of really funny moment. It's actually like comedic cinematography, comedic scene change. I don't even know what to say. I'm kind of a theater nerd, so like I really appreciate 
a fun cut. So anyway, that's where we kind of realize, obviously, for the first time that Thomas Seymour and Catherine are really into each other. Um, And I do get like the thoughts on the necessity of nudity and sex. I mean, I do get it. But y'all, they've been doing this to us since the Tudors. So we are not shocked. But I think it sets us up with tone. It sets us up for some playfulness in the script, a little irreverence. I appreciate some irreverence. Uh, And that does carry on through the rest of the episode. So say what you must, but I really like it. Okay, so Jessica Rain is the actress playing Catherine Parr in the series. And I don't know why, but I've never pictured Catherine Parr as a brunette. So when I finished the episode, obviously I had to go look up some of Catherine's portraits. And wouldn't you know it, I'm just crazy. She definitely has brown hair. Um, And some of the portraits might lean even a little into auburn, but it is dark. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I've been picturing her blonde and fair all this time. And I didn't have to picture her. There are portraits. Hello. But Stars has a really great casting department. So who am I to question anything? Should have known. So we're going to be graced with Tom Cullen playing Thomas Seymour, who is actually pretty age appropriate with casting. Seymour would have been uh, 39 in 1547. But remember, they've aged up our young actors. So while the Princess Elizabeth would have been 14, the absolutely fabulous Alicia von Drittenberg is older. Um, Also, as an unrelated side note, I think she looks a little bit like Claire Danes. Does anyone else see that? Am I losing it? Have I watched Little Women too much? Probably. Don't answer that. So Edward is taken to Whitehall, and Elizabeth goes to stay with her stepmother, Catherine Parr, at her home, Chelsea, which sadly was demolished in the 1750s, but in its day would have been beautiful, right on the River Thames for easy transportation of goods, easy travel, all the luxuries. And this makes perfect sense. We know historically Elizabeth and Catherine Parr were close and in agreement over things like Protestantism education, humanism, all those really great things. Um, And we do get a glimpse of Elizabeth's baby feminist ideas, this sense that she already knows she has to be cautious about men and protective over her autonomy, uh, which is, again, written really well so that it comes across very smoothly. It's not just like right in your face. Um, It feels very true to the character. But I do get the sense that these are things that at this point Elizabeth has observed or been taught and not necessarily things that she knows from experience yet. Um, So some of the vulnerability in Elizabeth here is so endearing and it really feels very much like a young woman or here, I mean, really, she's a young girl, and she's trying out her ideas. She's saying things out loud. She's being curious in general, and that's really appropriate for a 14-year-old. So this curiosity kind of does come out with her initial encounters with a drunk Thomas Seymour, who is pretty shamelessly flirting with her right from the start. This we know to be historically true. Um, Thomas and Elizabeth will be a central relationship for this series. So if you already know some of the history here, then you likely have strong feelings about this flirtation. If you are not so familiar, I'm going to put cards on the table and tell you now, Thomas Seymour is going to be trouble. But look, it's easy to look at a flirtation between a 39-year-old man and a 14-year-old child and be grossed out. That's like relatable. But what they're doing with the writing and also with some of the acting choices is kind of featuring the advances of Thomas from the perspective of Elizabeth. So we are walking this really fine line where we're actually being presented with the idea that this young teenager might actually have had like a little crush or a curiosity or um, this insistence to make it all make sense. So if we come at it from that creative interpretation, it works really well. 
Um, Obviously, if this were Thomas Seymour's story, it would look a lot different, but it's not. Not today, at least. Um, Now, I'm saying this, we're only one episode in. Creative license will clearly be taken. How far? I don't know. What do you think? Do we need to talk more about Thomas? I'm also reeling just a little bit at the thought of Thomas Seymour marrying Elizabeth. Because a Seymour marrying a Boleyn does not compute with me. If this was like really a consideration, it would actually say a lot about the ambitions of the Seymour family, sort of a power at all costs attitude. Although, I mean, that's hardly original at Tudor Court. So back to the original recap. Edward names his uncle, Edward Somerset, as the Lord Protector, which is basically someone who can make decisions, hold meetings, carry out orders, all on the king's behalf until the king is older and more capable. This, of course, makes Thomas angry because he feels like he should have been more equally considered. And I'll admit I don't know a whole lot about Thomas Seymour, so we're going to learn some things together on this recap journey. But I do know he was an educated man. He acted in his family's favor, but he also acted in his own favor here and there, his risky marriage to Catherine Parr being one. And actually, he only married her after he got rejected by the Princess Elizabeth um, in real life. Although they say that Thomas and Catherine had been like longtime loves, they wanted to marry before Catherine Parr was married to Henry VIII. And so then when he died, they took that opportunity. Um, Okay, and then we get this great scene at Edward VI's big coronation celebration, and we get a glimpse of Lady Jane Grey, played by the incomparable Bella Ramsey. If you're new to the historical fiction television world, Bella Ramsey played a very well-loved character in Game of Thrones and is basically a prodigy actor. So Stars has blessed us with this casting choice. Consider us thankful, Stars. So at the coronation, we see another great Easter egg from our showrunner, which is the fire breather. And this is an historically accurate inclusion. Um, On Twitter, Anya went ahead and told us that Edward is documented as having laughed at a tumbler all night. Obviously, for the purposes of getting more bang for our subscription buck, we get to see a fire breather. Um, Listen, I really like this inclusion because it seems so lively. We've seen Tudor Court parties in other shows. We've seen Plantagenet parties in shows and movies. I don't think I've ever seen one of these parties depicted as just like a full out, almost circus event where people are cheering and enjoying the entertainment. It almost, it almost felt to me more like what we see in, um, Versailles, something like that. So this was a really new, um, visual for me and I love it. Um, And it's a reminder that court entertainment looked all kinds of ways, and the Tudor kings and queens absolutely knew how to throw a good party, plain and simple. Um, I did one time go to a New Year's Eve party with people who did tricks with hula hoops that were on fire, and that was a really good time. So um, I totally find Edward VI relatable. Now... Okay, the timeline here gets a little fuzzy, but for storytelling purposes, I'm not mad at it. Edward's coronation was in February 1547, and in this episode, we see a really brutal battle between English and Scottish armies. And so many of you were like, why are they at war with Scotland? What is going on? Okay, Um, so the battle that I think they were depicting wouldn't have happened until later, almost maybe like September of 1547. But I understand why it had to happen simultaneously in the show. And that is to move along the marriage storyline of Edward. We're introduced to the fact that Edward is contracted to marry a five-year-old 
Mary, Queen of Scots. However, this is the drama. Many factions in and around the Scottish throne preferred a match between their princess and the Dauphin of France, Francis, Francois. Um, there's a Catholic religious preference, of course, but also the war we see in this show had actually been going on for years. It's sometimes called the Eight Years' War. It's sometimes called the Nine Years' War. Nobody really knows. So this is what it is. Henry VIII waged this war in 1543 because he was trying to force Scottish Parliament to commit to the marriage treaty between his son Edward and their princess Mary. And the Scottish really didn't want to. So Somerset, Edward Seymour, was in charge of the English strategy um, around this point in time. Uh, But ultimately, the Scottish smuggled Mary out of Scotland and over to France, where she did marry the Dauphin. So to have that side plot introduced and resolved in episode one is incredibly impressive, and I am so grateful that they found a good way to do that. Um, And obviously it paves the way for Jane Grey as a potential love interest. Um, By the way, the nickname of this war is called the Rough wooing, which it got way after, um, in sort of like hindsight. And it was like nicknamed the rough wooing, which I love. It's kind of petty. Um, so Mary queen of Scots is out of the picture. Jane gray is favored to catch Edward's eye and Thomas Seymour ever the ambitious planner has lady Jane moved into his home with Catherine Parr and Elizabeth. So this was another incident I had to research because I didn't recall it. And frankly, it is just too good of a plot device to be true. Uh, But we also know the Tudor period has fantastic family drama. So what I can find on this is that Lady Jane did actually live with Catherine Parr very briefly when she was nine. Her father sold her wardship to the widowed queen. And then Jane started doing, you know, taking on studies in Catherine Parr's household. This is pretty typical. We see it um, with like uh, Anne Boleyn going to court um, with Margaret of Austria. We see people all the time placed as ladies in waiting or um, going very young and learning under really smart um, scholarly women, noble women. So this is pretty typical. Um, But it does mean that Jane would have been surrounded by Protestant reformers and scholars, making her perhaps an even stronger option as a match for King Edward. Later, her wardship is transferred to Thomas Seymour. No spoilers. And she lives with him for nearly 18 months. So she's part of his household and even wrote at one point that she considered him like a father figure. So this plot line is looking really strong and really compelling. And I'm obsessed with Bella Ramsey's lines about being an indisputed, legitimate heir to the throne, while Elizabeth and her half-sister Mary uh, could be considered illegitimate. That was such a good scene. I I don't ever really think of Jane Grey as being a very strong personality, but the more I read about her and the interactions that she has with the Tudor family specifically, I'm just incredibly impressed. I think she would have been kind of a force to be reckoned with. Um, Okay, so basically at the end of episode one, Thomas Seymour has secured himself a powerful wife whom he presumably has loved for years and years. I love a happy ending to unrequited love. Uh, But he has also positioned two potential future queens into his household, the Lady Jane and the Princess Elizabeth. I don't know how many episodes of um, King Edward's storyline we're going to get because IMDb is being really shady 
and tricky about listing the number of episodes that some of these leading men and women appear in. So we really do have to tune in to see how the story unfolds. So hate the player, not the game, I guess. Um, Anyway, this is a quick reminder to find me on Twitter. My handle is at Miss Christine Mo, M S Christine Mo. Um, so let me know if you have questions about the next episode, what you want me to cover, uh, who you want to hear more about. Um, obviously, Elizabeth is just getting started. Um, I really hope that she she features prominently throughout. Uh, I have a feeling that she will. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for talking with me about this show. And I can't wait to go on this ride with you guys. I will see you next week. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please show your support by leaving a review wherever you listen. Reviews are some of the greatest gifts that you can leave a podcaster because it suggests their show to people who may not have even known it existed. So thank you so much for your support. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.